In today's video, economist Andre Polgar is going to tell us why he sees the signs of an upcoming economic collapse and what you, as a prepper, can do to survive this, right after the channel intro. Welcome to this community. I'm an avid prepper, an oath keeper, and I'm certified to teach firearms and the use of deadly force. If you want to learn actual prepping skills and how to protect yourself legally, then please subscribe and also click the bell icon so you won't miss whenever a video is released. So today we're going to talk with economist Andre Polgar, who's going to tell us how and why he sees a major economic reset coming our way. Something that could be life-changing and cause wars. Now Andre reached out to a couple of us different YouTube preppers because he really wanted to get his message out to the prepping community. So besides my interview today with Andre, I'm also going to later in the video provide a link that he did with an interview with Praxis Prepper and I actually think that that interview video that Praxis did is actually a little bit better than my interview that I did. And if you're not already familiar with Andre, and Andre, my apologies if I have already butchered your last name, but he has a YouTube channel titled One Minute Economics where he does a pretty good job of explaining economics to us non-economic people in videos that are just about a minute long. And I will definitely be putting a link to his YouTube channel in the description box below. So stay tuned so you can learn more about his prediction and also learn what you can do to keep you and your family from becoming homeless or starving when this happens. Okay, so here's my first question for Andre. So why exactly do you think that we are in for an impending economic collapse? Can you please give us a quick explanation of why you think this is going to happen? First of all, thank you for having me on and thank you guys for listening. To get things started, I want to make it clear that I am not afraid of just your average business cycle. So I'm not afraid of the fact that stock markets or real estate markets are going to collapse by, let's say, 50, 60 percent. No, I'm afraid of something much, much worse, which is a major change of narrative. And to explain this, let's keep things logical and take two quick steps back, specifically to the dot-com bubble. When that popped, people were panicking, everything seemed gloomy, but the narrative was this. Don't worry, governments and central banks have it all under control and are here to save the day. And they kind of did, except they didn't, in that, of course, they jump-started the economy, but they did so at a huge cost because they started getting that economy hooked on what I like to call economic cocaine. At the beginning, they did so by lowering interest rates after the dot-com bubble from 6.5% to just 1%, which doesn't seem like something amazing now, but it was huge back then. The problem was that there was a price to pay, and they kicked the can down the road at the expense of creating an even bigger bubble the real estate one. When that popped, once again, everyone panicked, but the narrative remained. Don't worry, governments and central banks have it all under control. The problem is that once you get the economy hooked on economic cocaine, it's going to demand a bigger and bigger dose. And that's exactly what happened. So after the Great Recession of 2007 to 2008, uh, you know, after that bubble popped, Lowering interest rates to 1% was no longer enough. They had to be brought down all the way to zero in the United States and even into negative territory in the European Union and Japan. And not only that, money had to be pumped directly into the system to the tune of, in the United States, $85 billion, guys, per month. Just to put this into perspective, from 1913, when uh, the third central bank of the U.S., the Federal Reserve, appeared, up until the Great Recession, so in almost 100 years, the monetary base had reached $850 billion. So that's one. Two, multiply those $85 billion per month by 12, and you'll realize that they've essentially, at the height of QE, injected more into the system, about a trillion, in one year than had existed after almost 100 years. And this leads me to my main concern, which is that eventually the narrative is going to change. Eventually, we are, of course, going to have another market crash, much like the dot-com bubble or the Great Recession. But this time, when governments and central banks offer this, the economy some more economic cocaine, 
the market is going to say no. And that no will translate into a massive loss of confidence. And once confidence is lost, all bets are off. So right off the bat, it's important to understand we are in for a huge economic collapse because one, the market's going to demand an ever-increasing dose of stimulus and there's only so far you can take it. Like they can maybe lower interest rates to negative 1% in the US and pump 3.5 trillion per year into the system. But again, things are already so outrageous that the likelihood of, of, of something breaking sooner rather than later is very, very high. Two, after the dot-com bubble and interest rates were lowered to 1%, they at least got a chance to climb back up, not to 6.5%, but to 5.25% again in the United States. So when the bubble popped again after the next recession, central banks at least had some ammunition. Right now, look at how low interest rates still are in the United States, and that's actually a decent case study. Let's not even talk about the European Union or Japan. So you have one, the fact that um, things are so downright unsustainable that something's bound to pop. Two, we have the fact that here we are 10 years, over 10 years actually, since the Great Recession uh, started and interest rates haven't exactly normalized. And three, don't forget to add common sense into the mix. You don't have to be a brilliant economist to understand that when there are so, so many pockets of anomaly in, in the system, be they economic ones, like an economy that's hooked on economic stimulus, or geopolitical ones, or anything of that nature, when you have so many of them, not the best decision, the only logical decision is to take financial preparedness more seriously. Okay, question number two, and how long do you think before this collapse happens? Basically, how long do us preppers have to prepare for this? And do you think that this is only a matter of months or a matter of years? What preppers need to understand when it comes to the economic dimension of this, in my opinion, is that here we are over 10 years since the Great Recession started, and historically speaking, only once has it happened that more time passed between recessions than right now. And in fact, if another year were to go by without us having a market crash, then it would be a record. Therefore, I believe that at this point, if you're watching this right now, the benefits associated with taking financial preparedness, which is what I specialize in, more seriously are just asymmetrically high. In other words, you have kind of like the perfect window to do this right now, because on the one hand, cyclically speaking, even leaving everything else aside, we are due or even overdue a recession. But on the other hand, nobody around you is panicking yet, because if you wait until that happens, you can have the smartest economist in the world by your side and it will be of little comfort. So essentially, even from this cyclical perspective that I've mentioned, the time to start preparing yourself when it comes to the financial dimension of your life is right now. After watching this video, it's just an insane privilege to have this window at your disposal. And I do believe you are going to regret it if you kind of procrastinate and postpone giving some thought to the financials at this point. Okay, now for the next question. Do you see this collapse as affecting only the USA or do you see this happening worldwide? And do you see it causing starvation? And do you believe that this collapse will be just as bad or if not worse than the first Great Depression that the United States had? And do you think that will become just as bad if not worse than Venezuela is right now? Perhaps the most important takeaway in all of this is that we have never lived in a more economically interconnected world. There's just no precedent of this happening at such a large scale. And therefore, no, it's definitely impossible or close to impossible for a huge financial cataclysm to only affect the United States, whereas everyone else is going to be fine. No. And the same way, if the European Union sneezes, then the United States is going to catch a cold as well. The same way, if the economy collapses in China, there are, be, there are going to be repercussions worldwide. And unfortunately, it's unbelievably hard to predict what happens next, precisely because the economy at this point, the worldwide economy, is kind of like a huge domino set. And that 
once things are set in motion, it's going to be, you know, pretty much every man for himself. Now, will there be starvation? It's hard for me to say, but as someone who has grown up in Eastern Europe and noticed quite a bit of stuff firsthand, I can say I'm probably in a better position than, let's say, the average person from a Western country to understand that systems that seem robust, like, you know, developed democracies, where there are all of these major institutions which are independent and supposed to safeguard against one another, and it all seems so robust. In fact, these systems are far more vulnerable than it seems, and they hang on by such a thin thread that it's just unbelievable. And to a large degree, that thread revolves around the confidence. So yes, it just scares me how the average person in the United States or Germany or a very developed country, how the average person just assumes that, for example, the supply chain is something you can take for granted, is something that will always work. No. Of course, we hope there will never be major, major disturbances in that area. But it would be a huge mistake not to prepare for that possibility. And the same way, can the United States end up like Venezuela? Well, right away, no, because there's no historic precedent of a major country going directly from being a huge superpower to unbelievably high inflation. Of course, you have Germany, but please keep in mind that when they had their major hyperinflation um the country had already been weakened by the loss of a world war, by the debilitating conditions imposed by the Treaty of Versailles, and so on. So therefore, no, it's more likely that country, uh, wealthy countries like the United States are going to first go through massive deterioration, economically speaking, and only then... Will they be candidates for major inflationary scenarios like what happened in Venezuela? But once again, once again, we can, of course, speculate. But the smartest thing to do, which is what I tell people in my book, the smartest thing to do is that you should build your own financial strategy that enables you to land on your feet under a wide range of circumstances. So don't make the you know the ego driven mistake of assuming that oh no you know exactly what's going to happen no i don't believe something similar to venezuela can happen in a developed country like the us but dedicating at least a bit of time and energy to prepare even for such scenarios is the smart thing to do and before we go to the next question a link to a poll should be appearing in the upper right hand corner of the screen about now and do me a favor go and take that poll and let me know about how much food that you have put back. Do you have a week's worth, month's worth, more than a year's worth? Let us know and let's see how we are doing as a prepper community. Okay, it doesn't sound like that Andre is overly concerned with the United States having a sudden plunge where we're eating out of trash dumpsters like Venezuela. But he is concerned with our economy having a reset and that it could eventually lead to actual war. And of course we know that war can lead to famine and dark times. So I think a smart approach to take is, is that along with having your money protected in such a way that an economist like Andre will recommend, but also having food and other basic survival needs stocked up. Just in case this future reset that Andre talks about does end up causing countries to go to war with each other. But let's listen on to what he has to say to see how much of his information that we can use in the prepper community. Okay, now for the next question. The Great Depression that the United States had uh, back in the early 1900s, it took about 10 years before our economy and way of life got back to normal. How long do you see this next economic collapse happening and before things would actually come back to normal? I keep pushing the idea to my readers, to my subscribers on YouTube, that you need to see the big picture because, um, sure, the economy might eventually collapse and it might seem that things are back on track, but we need to understand that so many of the events that have happened throughout history have a deep, deep, you know, have deep roots when it comes to economics. Like, of course, we had the Great Depression of 1929. But that led to many, many things which go well beyond how long it took for the economy to recover because as a result to a significant degree of that Great Depression, you had countries embarking on a journey to weaken their currencies so as to boost exports. If you want to call them that, 
they were currency wars. Then those currency wars turned into something much more dangerous in that countries all over the world embraced protectionist policies, once again, with the intention of protecting their own economy to the detriment of everyone else's economy. And when everyone does it, we have a problem. And to think that all of these things have not been a major cause of World War II would be a huge mistake. And therefore, the same principle needs to be applied when it comes to what's coming. Because yeah, we are going to be in, at least in my opinion, for a generation-defining big reset type situation. And where that leads us is very hard to predict if we only see things in a linear manner. So see the big picture. Don't just look at the economics. Take Analyze the geopolitical dimension as well. Look at the fact that already countries from all over the world have done their best to weaken their currencies so as to boost exports. Just look at the fact that as we speak, the United States and China are engaged in an open trade war, the likes of which humanity has never seen scale-wise throughout history. So for all of these reasons, for all of these reasons, it's not even important how long it's going to last. Sure, maybe it's going to last 10 years. Maybe it's going to be a bit shorter, a bit longer. What is more important, however, is to take a look at what's going to happen in the context of how it's going to change the world around us. Because we have some pretty dangerous toys right now when it comes to our civilization. And things that start out based on economics frequently degenerate, as I try to tell people in my book, frequently degenerate into conflicts on a truly massive scale. So do not, please do not forget to see everything we're discussing right now from that perspective as well. It's not just a matter of numbers. It's not just a matter of equations. No, no, no. These things are going to have political and ultimately highly tangible real life consequences. Okay, next question. What can people do to protect themselves from this upcoming collapse? First and foremost, and this is why I'm so excited about our collaboration right now, we need to understand that it's a team effort. Like, your number one goal, I feel, should be trying to learn from as many people as possible so that in the end, we can all leverage our strengths so as to collectively build something greater than ourselves. Like, of course, I specialize in the economic dimension of things. You specialize in other types of preparedness. And basically by making it possible for people to be exposed to my ideas, to your ideas, and essentially internalize the best of what both of us have to offer so as to have a well-rounded perspective, like it's unbelievable to me how huge of a difference this is going to make. Now, when it comes to uh, my area of expertise, the financial dimension, I will explain to people through the Age of Anomaly, through my book, what has happened many times throughout history, starting with the great, uh, with the tulip mania, which peaked in 1636 to 1637, and moving on to, of course, the dot-com bubble, to recent ones, the Great Recession, even lesser known uh, case studies like the short domain mania of 2015 to 2016, and I'm pretty sure I'm the only economist who even studied that. So I'm going to give them more than enough case studies that essentially enable them to have a firm grasp on history. And that firm grasp of history is going to tell them quite a bit about human nature, about what makes us tick, about why we get overly euphoric sometimes, why that ends up degenerating into full-fledged panic mode, and so on. I then draw conclusions, draw parallels, and essentially help people use that knowledge to increase the likelihood that they're going to that they're going to spot the next financial crisis as early on as possible. But I also teach people and I tell them, look, I think about these things all day due to the nature of my occupation, but I need to have the humility it takes to understand that even I might be taken by surprise by whichever event causes the next financial crisis. And therefore, the second dimension of my book revolves around spending just as much time and energy becoming more financially resilient in general, building your own portfolio based on your specific situation, based on your specific needs. I don't want to get people hooked on just, you know, me spoon feeding them information. No, I am going to essentially turn you into a good, logical, economic thinker. You're going to know exactly what you want to invest in, why you want to invest in, 
and how you're going to do it. And this knowledge is going to ultimately give you the clarity it takes to be, as Buffett says, greedy when everyone else is fearful and fearful when everyone else is greedy. So essentially, when everyone around you is panicking, economically speaking, you're going to say, wait a second, I know how things stand, I have this solid foundation of knowledge, and when everyone is bottom-selling portfolios and losing a bunch of money, you will, of course, be able to say, wait a second, this might actually be a good opportunity for me to buy this, to buy that. And essentially, and eventually, you're going to reach your goal of having exactly the type of balanced exposure to various assets that you need to land on your feet under a wide, wide range of circumstances. It's not rocket science. You definitely don't have to be an economist to pull it off. And especially since you have the huge privilege of being able to start preparing right now, I believe, and I try to teach people that in the age of anomaly, that a few simple core principles, if you internalize them, can make the difference between essentially financial ruin and being able to save yourself, being able to save your family. So guys, don't make the mistake, never make the mistake of not paying enough attention to the financial dimension of things. Okay, Andre, you have written a book about this upcoming economic collapse in your book that's titled The Age of Anomaly, Spotting Financial Storms in a Sea of Uncertainty. So can you t just take a minute and tell us how that we can purchase this book? Well, it can pretty much be found everywhere books are sold. I'm going to go ahead and show you, show it to you guys real quick. It's called The Age of Anomaly. The full title is The Age of Anomaly, Spotting Financial Storms in the Sea of Uncertainty. And I mean, it's a huge book. It's a huge 400 plus page book. But I promise you that when reading it, it's not going to seem like, you know, there's this arrogant economist who's talking down to you from his ivory tower. And instead, it's going to just seem that you have a friend who's giving you a few tips, a friend who just so happens to be good at economics and money-related stuff in general. You can buy it on Amazon, you can buy it on Barnes & Noble, you can buy it on iBooks, which is Apple's app, and you can even buy it on Kobo. To find all of the links, you can simply go to ageofanomaly.com, which is a domain I use for the book, and you'll be, you'll be able to find all of them. It's also important to note that this week, the week uh, during which this video is going to be published, I'm running a huge promo deal. So essentially, you're going to be able to buy that book, and I'm not kidding at all when I say this, for just 99 cents. I tell people all the time, when someone's in it for the money, he doesn't write a 400 plus page book and then sells it for a buck. The war I'm fighting is a war for people's minds, for people's attention, to get them to pay attention to the financial dimension of their lives and to do it now while there is still time to take action. So if you're going to buy the book, I would strongly recommend doing it uh, this week when it's pretty much as close to free as they'll let me price it. If you like it, of course, tell others about it, spread the word. And in the end, we need to never lose sight of the fact that we're in this together. And here's the next question that myself and a lot of the viewers will want to know. Do you consider yourself to be a prepper or a survivalist? As someone who grew up in Romania, I was fortunate, or depending on how you look at it, unfortunate enough to witness a lot of stuff going bad, economically speaking, firsthand. Throughout my existence here, we've had massive inflation, we've had quite a few banking-related issues, and a lot of the things that could go wrong, financially speaking, actually went wrong in Romania. Then, through my parents, I have had indirect experience, or in other words, they ended up educating me in a way where I understood quite a bit about how bad things were here under the communist regime. So I also was able to take advantage of that perspective of life. And furthermore, the influence of my great-grandparents told me quite a bit about war-related survival uh, scenarios. And essentially all of that has given me such a well-rounded perspective, I feel, on life that, yeah, I don't even think of it as prepping. To me, it's second nature. To me, it's something I have to do. It's something I want to do. It's just something I consider normal, I consider rational, and I consider logical. So with that in mind, even before I knew what prepping even was, so even, uh, even before there was a name for it, I was always the type of person who was educated in a way 
you know, that uh, enabled him to understand that systems sometimes fail. And it's that perspective on life that, again, essentially made me a prepper before I even knew that being a prepper was a thing. Okay, now before we ask the next question of Andre, let me say that I am not an economist. I only know that I need to spend less money than what I have coming in. So I cannot say with certainty that Andre is a top-notch economist. And because I know nothing about economics, I would be making a ignorant claim to try to say that he or anybody else was a top-notch economist. So what I'm going to tell you, the viewer, is that you should listen to what Andre has to say and listen to his reasoning behind it and then make your own informed decision if Andre is giving us, the, our prepper community, good information or not. But as far as myself goes, since I know nothing about economics and Andre appears to know quite a bit about economics, I am going to definitely take heed into what he is saying. Okay, Andre, for the final question for you, please take a second to tell the viewers of why they should consider you to be a good, reliable source on economics. In my book, I actually make it a goal to tell people to question absolutely everything, including my own work. It's never been my intention to kind of brand myself as a guru or someone who is so perfect that he has it all figured out and can do no wrong. And I think one of the main reasons is just that the authenticity I put on the table through my work. Number two, there's of course the fact that I believe I can put a very good balance between book smarts, from a bachelor's degree in economics to PhD, and street smarts, because aside from that, I've also run businesses. I've run hosting businesses and ended up getting hacked by people from all continents. That taught me a thing or two about uh, the importance of having redundant systems in place. I've ran, you know, brokerage services, auction platforms, a small escrow service, which once again taught me quite a few things about business and life. So kind of by having this good combination between real world experience and also academic credentials, I think that makes my perspective extremely interesting, at least. And also my background as someone who grew up in Eastern Europe and was more accustomed, I would say, than the average Westerner to the idea that systems can and will eventually fail, this once again adds a layer of, you know, authenticity to what I'm telling people it, 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 it it's kind of a perspective that, as you've pointed out, you know, it doesn't have to be the only thing in your life when it comes to economics, my books, my work, no. But I believe it's most definitely worth taking into consideration. And finally, I am genuinely not in it for the money because as mentioned previously, I run a lot of projects that are far good at, let's say, putting food on the table than writing books or making YouTube videos. In fact, it's precisely the fact that I approach my academic work from a position of relative financial comfort, that enables me to tell people not what I know they want to hear just so I can be popular, it enables me to tell people what I believe they should know, which is what a thought leader should be doing in the first place. As I've mentioned previously in this video, someone who's in it for the money is definitely not going to write a 400 plus page book and kind of pour his heart and soul into it only to sell it for a dollar. The war I'm fighting, once again, is a war for people's attention. It's a war for people's minds. And essentially, the main reward I, ha I want is knowing that I've done my best to plant seeds in as many minds as possible in the hope that many of them will germinate and turn into something truly awesome. And with that said, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for tuning into our discussion. And I genuinely believe and hope that you'll be able to extract tons of value from the things that have been covered today. Take care, guys. So like I mentioned earlier in the video, Praxis Prepper also did an interview with Andre. And I, again, I think that uh, Praxis did a better job with the interview than I did. So please check out that video and a link should be appearing in the upper right hand corner of the screen just about now.
So folks, to help keep you from being arrested if you're forced to protect yourself, then click on the link that should be appearing in the upper right hand corner of the screen about now, where you can learn self-defense law that makes it easy and understandable. And folks, as a prepper, you should also know how to properly bind any suspicious people that you may catch at your bug out or retreat location after SHTF. So to learn just one more way to save your life after SHTF, then click on the video card appearing on the screen about now. Anyways, folks, if you may it this far. Hey, thank you very much for watching, and I pray that you have a good night.